Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Praise be to God. Can you pray with me? Mighty God, I pray the words of my mouth and the thoughts on all of our hearts might be acceptable to you. O God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've uh, started to notice a trend that seems to be gaining more traction within the church, and maybe more specifically the United Methodist Church, and that is that more and more people are denying the existence of Satan. I actually saw a Facebook post on a clergy group that I'm a part of on, on Facebook. It's a United Methodist one. And there were over 200 comments uh, concerning this passage for today, debating the existence of the devil. And I think that I can sort of understand why. I mean, the concept of such a being is just so medieval, maybe so unenlightened. So for most people, Satan has been relegated in the realm of horror movies or maybe horror novels. But what I find so interesting about how the devil is portrayed in those works is that he is so obviously evil, right? Sort of hard to miss. It's obvious. And just think of some of the horror movies that you may have seen. Strange events are taking place. People are mysteriously and dis- disappearing uh, miraculously, and now a strange noise is coming from behind a door. And this innocent yet very unintelligent teenager is walking towards that door. You've seen movies like that, and when I see those, in my back of my mind, I'm always saying, you've got to be kidding me. Come on. It's obvious that whatever is behind that door is not good news. You should be running in the opposite direction, not walking towards it, but almost like a moth drawn to fire, this kid, who is obviously not playing with a full deck of cards, continues to walk towards this door, opens it, and whatever evil is so obvious comes out, and you know what happens. There's one less teenager in the world. But what is not so obvious is that evil, or Satan, if you will, comes to us usually in much more subtle ways. And I'm not saying that that horror movies are bad. I mean, a good scary movie is okay every once in a while is nothing more than to just get the adrenaline flowing. And some people, like myself, like to laugh and how unintelligent people in those movies can act. But I think that there is a problem that we as Christians do need to take note of. And that problem is that In movies like these, Satan has become almost like a make-believe creature. And the problem that is in real life, we don't encounter Satan like he is portrayed in these works. Our encounters are more subtle. And our scripture reading for today is one of those encounters. Let's think about Jesus and what Jesus was going through just for a moment here. He'd been out in the wilderness, it says, fasting for 40 days. He had not eaten anything. And the wilderness of, of Judea is, is an interesting area. It has almost nothing that is around. It's rocky, it's barren, it's incredibly hot during the day, and it is absolutely frigid at night. Nothing really grows there. Not even cactus can find enough water to grow in that, that wilderness. What little water you might find usually is not safe to drink. Jesus has to be hungry, he is thirsty, His skin is scorched. He might even be suffering from exposure. 
In short, Jesus is vulnerable in almost every way a person can be vulnerable. And it's in that condition that Luke tells us that the devil came to tempt Jesus. But this isn't the devil of Hollywood invention. This is not a fanged demon that is so obviously evil. This is the real thing. The devil of subtle test, of subtle temptation. It is not the fire-breathing, pitchfork-carrying, horned beast that you find in medieval imagery or in bad dreams. When you think of the devil, and if you ever debate in your head whether the devil is real or not, I think that you need to think of your weakest moment. Take hunger, for example. We are in the season of Lent, after all. During the season of Lent, many people will fast. They'll give up certain foods. And on certain days, they may skip a meal altogether. If you've ever done fasting uh, for Lent, or if you've ever had to fast for a medical procedure, you know how overwhelming hunger can be. I once took place, or I've actually done it two times now, taking place in a 30-hour famine. It's a youth event where you fast for 30 hours to raise awareness about world hunger. And near the end of that, food is almost all you can think about for a certain period of time. If you've ever had to fast for a medical procedure, you know how that can feel as well. That's all you can think about. And there's this little voice in the back of your head that keeps saying, come on, just take one bite. No one will know. It's not going to hurt anybody. And you'll feel so much better. That might just be after several hours, not even a full day. Jesus had been without food for 40 days. I think it's more than safe to say that there may have been a little voice in the back of his his head as well, telling him, the same thing. And that's the devil that Luke is talking about, the real devil. Real devil tries to use logic on us when we are at our weakest. And that is something that I think is important for us to remember as we think about our gospel reading for today, is that Satan comes to us when we are at our weakest. And Luke is speaking to a profound theological issue in our reading for today. Namely, he's talking about the dual nature of Christ, that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Now, some people think it has to be one way or the other, but if Jesus was only divine, the devil had no power over him in the first place. And if Jesus were only human, why bother with the temptation anyway? Why offer Jesus all the kingdoms of the world? Because Jesus is both. Jesus is fully human and fully divine. We say this doctrinally and theologically, as being fully human, fully divine, 100% of the time. Back in the early church, uh, this was something that was debated quite intensely. People sometimes were labeled as heretics. They were excommunicated from the church until we finally finally came onto a a somewhat agreed-upon understanding of what it meant to be fully human and fully divine. And the reason I say somewhat agreed upon is because it's still somewhat debated today uh, between denominations. And I think that what the devil was trying to do in our scripture for today was to separate the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. He was trying to break God down to the human level. The surprise, however, was that God had already come down to that level because Jesus was fully human. And God, as Jesus, was encountering what we encounter every day of our lives. He was encountering subtle trials, subtle temptations in a moment of great weakness. And there are several ways that you can look at this passage. You can, you can read it as a passage of, of Jesus' triumph over a time of uh, forces of evil, but I thought we can also read it as a moment in Jesus' life that helps us save us from sin. It's a moment that is a wonderful part of the good news of Jesus Christ, and what's so wonderful about it is because in this moment, we're being told that God understands. God understands what we as humans, have to face at the hands of the devil. If Jesus were only divine, like I said, he wouldn't have had to face these trials, the temptations that we do in our human weakness. Jesus would never have to know what it is to experience the devil's power from a human point of view. And in much the same way, if Jesus were only human, then God would never have had had the opportunity to know what we experience when we encounter the devil and the temptations in life. And that's why I think it's important to remember and to understand that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. It enables Jesus to have, to have a human experience as God. I've talked about this before, and I'll 
say this again, this is what makes the Christian faith so different from all the other religions that you find of in the world. It's not uncommon in other religions to find how the, or read how the gods came to earth pretending to be human. And the word pretend there is the, the key word. Jesus was not pretending to be human. Jesus really was a human. He came to us as one of us. Only in the Christian faith does God love us that much to become one of us. So God knows and God understands what it is that we experience. And think about how the devil confronts Jesus in the scripture. The devil comes to Jesus right when he is physically weak. Jesus is experiencing deep hunger. So the devil says, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Now, is that something that Jesus could have done? Sure. I don't think that would have been a problem at all. He is, however, he is a God, fully divine. So the, the temptation to use his power would have been great in this moment. And think about that in comparison to the trials and the temptations that we might experience. I mean, none of us have the power to turn a stone into a loaf of bread. At least I know that I don't. If any of you do, please come and talk to me. But don't think that any of us are able to do that. Jesus is experiencing deep physical pain from being this hungry. It's a human feeling. Given the fact that he is also fully divine, this trial, this temptation is all the more powerful. It's more powerful than anything that we go through. But Jesus does resist by saying, man shall not live on bread alone, which has several meanings for us. We don't live by bread alone. What do we live by? Because our physical lives, our earthly lives, are sustained by physical food. But our spiritual lives, our eternal lives, are sustained by spiritual food, something that we find in the Eucharist, the Word of God, God the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Luke is telling us what we need to, uh, in order to have this eternal life. We may noticed how the devil was very subtle in his attack on Jesus here. Jesus didn't give a subtle response, though. So the devil goes after Jesus for round two. And this time it has nothing to do with immediate physical uh, weakness. It has to do with the devil's perceptions of future weakness. He offers Jesus glory and authority over all the kingdoms of earth if Jesus will simply bow down and worship him. You may be wondering what it is that Satan is up to here. Once again, he is going after a human weakness in Jesus. He is going after human fear. So remember, Jesus knew what lay ahead for him. We also know what lays ahead of him. The cross is looming large in the future. What would you do to avoid a future that involves a horrible, unbelievably painful death? Again, knowing that Jesus is fully human and fully divine, this trial, this temptation of the human nature of Jesus brings about another understanding of God the human nature of Jesus that resists in order to serve God, and in the God nature of Jesus that gains understanding of what it really means and what it takes to resist. The devil isn't done. He takes Jesus to the top of the temple and says, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down from here. For it is written, he will put his angels in charge of you to guard you. And how many times in our own lives do we test God in our weakest moments? Jesus is in an extremely weakened condition. It would have been very easy for him to give in to the human nature and to seek the comfort of angels. His human nature, though, refused to test God. And in that resisting, he gained a more firsthand understanding and experience of what it means to be human. And that, I think, is the big thing that we take from this scripture for today. That God knows what it's like to be one of us. God knows all of our weaknesses firsthand because God came to us as one of us lived as one of us, died as one of us, died for all of us. God understands that we're not strong enough to go all the way up to God. So God comes down to us and God lifts us up, knowing that we can't do this all on our own. In the faithfulness and through the work of the triune God, the devil loses his power and his grip over us. So we need to keep in mind how the devil works in our lives, that it is a very subtle thing. 
Sometimes you don't even notice it. But we do know that the devil is real. We know that the devil is real because we experience trials. We experience temptations each and every day. Usually they are very subtle. And the good news is that God knows. God knows and God understands. And marked with the cross of Christ, we are forgiven and we are saved. And for that, I say thanks be to God. Amen.